So hello world. I hope everybody's doing all right on the out there on this Saturday morning. Um, today, welcome to the Psych Life channel. And today as a guest, we have Elena Podrovsky, who is the author on On My Period book. How are you, Elena? Hi Juan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, I'm doing amazing, especially now that I got you here in front of me. Um, I found uh I saw that you posted one of our IG posts, and that's how I found you. And then when I clicked on your profile, I saw that you were an author. And you weren't just any author. You were an author who wrote about something I've never seen before, which was the female menstrual cycle. And I want to say thank you for that because you're helping raise awareness on so many levels. Do you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and your book? Yeah, sure. Um, so this is the book and um my good friend aaron created the um the image in the front which is meant to be like a rorschach blotch um and so we designed that together um and i wrote all all the poems in my book uh, throughout the duration of nine nine months um while on my period so each week that i would be on my period i would be writing and um it was meant to to sh show all the thoughts that go on um, in in my mind, pure, raw, unedited, and just to have it all out there. Holy cow, the female <laughs> menstrual cycle. And, you know, I, I ha wasn't able to completely purchase your book, but you were kind enough to send me a few articles. Mm -hmm. And there's so many questions that I have prepared lined up for you. I guess the first one to start off to make this a good interview, Elena, for the audience as well, is what inspired you to write this book? Because nine months dedication time for every time that you were in the menstrual, in the time frame of the menstrual cycle is almost the time it takes um, of a female to, you know, to give birth. So that's what makes yeah. it extra interesting. What motivated you to write this book? It's a great question. Um, I think that I just needed to, to write. I think during that period in my life, I had a lot to say and, um, and I just kept writing wherever I was. I would save all poems or ideas for poems as drafts in my um, email um, box and, and then I would get back to them. Um, and I think that I, I really just wanted to write just for, for myself. I, I was feeling very confined during that time. Um, I was in a very regimented um, place uh, through grad school. As you can understand, it feels very highly regimented and I needed that creative outlet. And um, it made my cycles more fun, so. Okay, uh, about, you know, yeah. I, <laughs> I appreciate that, Elena. I have like a whole script written, but once in a while <laughs> I'm gonna go off the script because that's go a lot of, it. yeah, you said that, it made your cycle more um, enjoyable, I guess, or, or better. Uh, in what sense? Because before the writing, what would you experience as a female during the menstrual cycle? And if you don't mind me asking, these are going to be some intimate questions. And I know I'm a male. And so if you don't feel comfortable answering it during this interview, please don't, don't hesitate and say so, okay? Well, I wrote a book on... <laughs> my period. So I think at that point, it's just asking for questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, a lot of a lot of people who menstruate um, complain sometimes of, of cramps, or, you know, it's, it's the only time they allow themselves to indulge in whatever they want, whether it's food or movies or whatever hobbies they're really into at all points in their life. They really feel um, like they're able to indulge during that time. And, you know, whether they blame it on hormones or that time of the month or whatever it is, I think that we should just allow ourselves to do that at any point um, and, and not limited to this time. Um, you know, some, some people who menstruate may feel like they um, are only able to really fully express their emotions, such as anger um, during that time and blame it on you know, hormones or whatever it may be. Um, and what I'm proposing is why not at any time? Why, why just during that time of the month? Why not, you know, why can't 
um, historically women just be angry anytime. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. And, and, um, and I hope I'm keeping up here. Okay. Because this yeah. is some really insightful stuff, but you're, you're saying it's almost as a woman or, you know, woman is obviously the gender, the female is more of the sex, but mm -hmm. for, for the sake of it, um, a lot of times women are forgiven in showing emotion during their menstrual cycle. Right. And mm -hmm. you're, you're saying that, that, you feel like, why can't this be all the time? And there's still a stigma surrounding that. Oh, she's experienced, she's upset because she's on her menstrual cycle. And that's, and that's kind of um, a stereotype. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and growing up, I remember other kids saying, oh, she must be, excuse the language of PMSing or whatnot. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's not fair. It really is not fair because it almost says like if a woman should be very nurturing, they should be quiet. And if they're getting upset or they're, they feel that something's is injustice and they're speaking out about it, then they're on their menstrual cycle. And there's okay. a stigma surrounding that big time. And I've even seen it myself. It's not, you know, made up. So I just want to make sure that's what, I, that's what you were trying to express there, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I appreciate that. So I got some cool facts here. You know, I have some a lot of good yeah. questions about your book. But you know, for the audience out there, a female will only experience the menstrual cycle period somewhere between 150 to as many as 450 times in their lifespan. And this is very interesting because uh, it it doesn't happen as often as we think it does. You know, and the fact that you decided to write your book in a span of nine months, you really took the amount of times that you're going to have the menstrual cycle in your life and really put it to good use. So <laughs> that's really, that's really cool. And another thing is the average start of the menstrual cycle has changed for females over time. I remember reading a research article that about 60 to 70 years ago, typically the menstrual cycle would begin anywhere between age 14 to as late as age 17. Now, mm -hmm. when we look at the research, the it shows that females are beginning the menstrual cycle as early as age nine, mm -hmm. all the way to age 14. What, you know, this is not in your book per se, and I have a lot of good questions about your book, but I really wanted to just ask this question because I think it's an insightful question. Why do you think this is, Elena? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I I don't know. I don't know why it is. I, I can only say that it differs for for every um, you know everyone who every female experiencing this. Um, I'm sure there are so many scientific uh, theories as to why that's happening. Um, but I also you know part of me wonders what the societal impact is. Is there a stress on on girls to to grow up or mature quicker? Um, and and I'm sure that that depends on the environmental factors as well, the whole biopsychosocial aspect of it all. Um, do you have any thoughts on it? I uh, yeah, they they actually don't know exactly why. And I was reading a lot of research before interviewing you just because I wanted to be prepared. <laughs> okay. But they don't know exactly why this is happening. One of the reasons they did mention is the stressors. And I don't think individuals in our society, we've become desensitized to the amount of information and stimuli that we are constantly being asked to assess on a daily basis. It's definitely increased over the years. And mm -hmm. now I wonder what effect that has had on the brain and on the female's uh, body physiological right. response it's had. And also the food we have no idea we're in some times now where the food is so processed that we don't know the effects it's had on our body and our brain. So those were the two key. They have no causation, just like mostly any real research doesn't always have causation. They just have um, correlational studies and then they form conclusions off it. So it's very interesting. Now to get to your book, because I have so many good questions. Mm -hmm. uh, did you catch yourself? while writing this book, experiencing certain patterns of thoughts while you were writing? Like, did your psyche change? Did the way that you see things change while writing this book while in your menstrual cycle? Mm -hmm. um, I think I was more 
embodied. I, I think I listen to my body more. Um, and, and that's going back to even what we were talking about just now in, in the age that one begins their, their first menstrual cycle. Um, I mean, that all of that is really important. Our bodies are so powerful, as, as you know, and, and so a lot of um, emotions can physically manifest. So I think it really helped me to focus and tune in on what I was experiencing and embody that within my poetry. You said what you were experiencing. So when I asked you the question about thoughts and you, you, you went a little bit into feelings, what is it that, that you were experiencing while writing this book during your menstrual cycle? And I know these are some really deep questions. And once again, yeah. I'm sorry, but I, but well, I'm going to take the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> but as, uh, and I appreciate that, but as I'm going to take the opportunity as having you here as my guest, what were you experiencing? Because as a male, you know, you can read, we can read everything, um, all the textbooks, all the, the, the private literature and all the research, but we're still not going to know what um what it is like to go through the menstrual cycle so when you say you felt more in touch with your embodiment and what you were feeling and thinking um as myself i i think as the menstrual cycle a woman a female going through the roller coasters of ups and downs but mm -hmm. but i just want to hear when you say experiencing what what exactly does that mean mm -hmm. That's a great question. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm going through roller coasters all the time. That's why I don't actually enjoy roller coasters. I have enough of that in my own <laughs> <laughs> life. Um, so, so that's also part of it, right? Like we're always having all of these, uh, I mean, any of us, um, all of these emotional roller coasters. And, and I think that because I was only able to write during that one week where I was having um, my menstrual cycle, I fully embraced the roller coaster and I, you know, strapped tight and, um, and I was able to ride through all my emotions. I think during that period in my life, I had a lot of frustration with the uh, rigid structure of society and, um, and maybe a need to just put it all out there and a cathartic release of creativity. Um, and more particularly, I think even with the, the field of psychology, I felt like there was so much data, so much information out there, um, so many studies and peer-reviewed journals um, that I felt almost like we were missing the personal touch. And, and I really wanted to bring that in, um, that psychology can be felt and experienced in so many different ways. Did you... Did and I um and I'm glad you strapped in for this one, okay? Uh, and and I'm not sure if when you finished your book as a finished product, um, mm -hmm. how you felt about it. But I guess I'll ask that question at the end. What is typically typically your experience um, while you're going through the menstrual cycle? Mm -hmm. I think when I was younger, I had. Um, more cramps than I do now. Um, sometimes you, I feel like I feel the, the just like a, the shredding of my <laughs> uterus. Um, uh, and, and then there are some memes on Instagram that I found very funny and, and true um, that, you know, there's a character with the face like a surprised or shocked face and and then the title reads um or the caption reads the moment when you realize you got your period and and i feel like that's that's sh so telling of um how in tune people can be with their bodies that you know when you when you get it but you also don't always know so we know our bodies but we also don't know them as well as we think we do and um and in middle school, I remember girls just asking their friends, like, can you look behind me? And usually what that meant was, do you see any blood on me? And I thought that was so interesting that we're so scared. Um, we all know that, you know, this happens. This is so natural. And yet we're so scared of any semblance of blood on us. We don't want to be caught red-handed. Um, th this is exactly why I wanted you on this platform to raise awareness for small things like this and small social cues that actually go a long way. And 
people feel uncomfortable talking about it, just myself included, the mm. first page of of some of the poems you sent me, I was I read like the first three lines and I had to, and I looked away. I was like, oh my god, what am I? What did I get myself into? But I but I'm glad I'm glad because um, I'm challenging myself mm. and. I'm breaking down some of the stigmas while it's happening. Yeah. And just that little portion where, oh, can you look behind me? You know, uh, a kid in middle school, boy, isn't going to understand what's going on. They don't understand the feelings involved, the embarrassment involved, mm -hmm. if there is blood showing, because it's not something they have to worry about. So mm -hmm. the fact that you bring that up, uh, it's really breaking some of the stigma surrounding it. And I appreciate you sharing that um, mm -hmm. with and Duh. I appreciate you challenging yourself. I think that's really important um, that our bodies often are stigmatized so much um, and for, for females, males, and everyone in between. But I think that a lot of, you know, getting through all of that is sitting with the anxiety and talking and having discussions like you and I are today. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so in your book, I felt that you conveyed it to be freeing, peaceful, and at times a radical action to be in your menstrual cycle. And obviously this is based off the six or eight passages that were sent to me. And this is the what I analyzed. Is this what you were trying to convey in your book? Yeah, I think that's well said. Absolutely. Ooh. Well, thank you so much for that. So I guess I am doing a good job and really am challenging <laughs> myself good in a good way. Society well, what um on, on reading it how did you feel okay so well when you sent me a few of the passages yesterday mm -hmm. uh i the first one was very detailed as and i think it says something along the lines of as i watch my blood and and you know and that's when i looked away and i looked at the <laughs> other person in the room that was with me that's uh you know my my girlfriend and i go oh my gosh this is intense like what did i get myself into here <laughs> And, what did your and girlfriend I, say? Well, I asked her to help me dissect it a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to say the wrong things during this interview, and I mm -hmm. wanted to be understanding. And you know, if if I can break the stigmas, you know, because I grew up in suburban Miami, mm -hmm. where there's this really big rap culture, and with that comes a masculinity culture, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I was part of that. I grew up being part of that uh and and so breaking down barriers is something that i'm constantly having to do and it's mm -hmm. represented when i work with my female clients you know because mm -hmm. as a substance use therapist sometimes i have to do drug screenings and okay. once and there's sometimes they'll tell me something along the lines of oh i'm i'm going through my menstrual cycle is that okay and i always say yeah because you know i use the gloves and the whole nine yards and so and now the masks it, too <laughs> and the masks now too you add that one in and so it's a learning experience and um i think that's what the point of all this always is in psychology you know it's not the knowing of facts the way they're presented sometimes at school it's actually understanding human behaviors the stigma surrounding society why people do things and how we can learn from them to move forward mm -hmm. and that last part is something that's missing and that's something that your book does because it gives you a perspective from the female anatomy and physiology as to what's going on inside. Like you said that you felt that was missing. There's a bunch of research articles, there's a bunch of facts, but there's no personal, um, there's no personal sharing of what a person mm -hmm. feels. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the compliments, by the way, they tend not to come too far to my side, but <laughs> what, why has society, now that we're talking about this, I'm glad. Why has society painted um, the menstrual cycle as something to be ashamed of? Why, why is it? And, and part of it is, and, and I'm so sorry, it's probably bad for interviewing, but I just want to share this. Sometimes I feel like since society has been powered by men, oftentimes there's been a lot of men in power, men are scared of what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And, and that, is, that is something I'm sure that weighs in on it but i just want to see from your perspective why do you feel society throughout the years has made the menstrual cycle something to be ashamed of mm -hmm. yeah i i'd love i'd love to hear everyone's perspective on that i, I don't know um i think um 
you know, we're not scared to talk about safe sex and condom use and this and give out free condoms in schools, but we are um, still afraid to talk about blood, um, especially when it comes from uh, women identifying people um, or, or, you know, people who just menstruate in general. Um, but I think, you know, you mentioned hypermasculinity, and that's a great point. Um, a lot of us are okay with watching, um, you know, shows and seeing blood that comes out during a fight out of any part of the body, um, whether it's the lips or the face, you know, when, when there's like a, a fight on TV or some violence action, we're, we're okay with that. But you know, God forbid we have, we have some period blood showing, um, blood is blood, but it's so fascinating what society makes of it when it comes out of a specific body part. <laughs> in, in tampon and pad commercials, they focus on eliminating smells. What, <laughs> does, does that bother you? Um, because it's almost when they do that, it's almost like, Oh, this is, this is something to be ashamed about and you need to be hiding. What are your feelings regarding that? And and these are random questions, but yeah, I, I, I really that. did my research for you. So right, no, they're they're, they're so great questions. Um, and and I'm, <laughs> it's funny that you had to you know run through this by your girlfriend, which I'm sure you're so, you know, so glad um you had her help with the but she did yeah. help me out a lot. She did help <laughs> me out a lot. Um, I think that yeah that's that's a great point uh the smells um the discreetness of periods those are heavily tuned in on during these commercials um that you can't see the pad you can't see the tampon um they you know so much coverage so that you don't leak um and then what these commercials do to people who menstruate um and i'll speak you know for myself is that you, you get scared of, of leaking as a woman. Um, so I'm based in New York City, so we have you know this term for man spreading. Um, and, and that's sort of okay, right? Like it's, uh, people say, you know, don't try not to man spread, but it's sort of okay. Whereas women, uh, when we sit with, with our legs crossed or t trying to take up as little space as possible or trying to be as discreet as possible, I'm trying to cover any smell uh, that's not good, um, although it's natural. Uh, we're taught it's not good. I think that does so much to women psychologically, emotionally. We're taught to cover even more and more of ourselves. Uh, um, the man spread. I, I'm so sorry about some of these terminologies. You mean when the man sits like, you know, uh, with their legs spread out for the space? That's what you're Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay and it's funny that you mentioned the whole smell thing uh and how and i never you know some of these things it's like you learn it but it goes through one side of the year and out the other into the unconscious because it, do, it doesn't apply to an individual mm -hmm. like myself but it really does uh you know when we really think about it and i never thought about that uh, about when why women sit with their legs crossed it's mm -hmm. uh and I never thought about the smell aspect. I always thought it was more of I'm not giving entryway or something along those lines. But it's it's obviously so, it's so much more than that. It's not one variable. It's also the smell component. I can only imagine how that's like um, and to put the how society portrays that smell as it's bad because males also have a smell that comes out that's very that's very heavy. But that one doesn't get as much uh, oh you you better cover that up you better shower you better do this and we obviously don't have that type of stuff uh to to masquerade that smell so um and and most most individuals those that actually explore their sexuality mm -hmm. and really dig in deep and become comfortable with themselves you'll see uh, i've seen that actually the smell is part of arousal it's just mm -hmm. they don't even realize it because okay. they've they're thinking in such a concrete manner, but um, studies have shown that the reason why we do things isn't exactly why we do them. And mm -hmm. it's just recently in the last 30 years where that un those unconscious be uh, reasons as to why we do things are being brought about more. Mm 
Um, because as you know, when Freud made the unconscious, it took, you know, it was very popular, but then the next 30 or 40 years of psychology, that word was forbidden to be used. And now it's being brought about again. So man, this is some really cool stuff. And I really appreciate this interview so far. So I'm going to yeah. keep going with some of these questions, if you don't mind. Uh, Go for it. Do you, do you feel that writing while on your menstrual cycle enabled you to be able to express ideas, ideas or themes you don't usually feel you can write about? Um, it was a good excuse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could have, you know, always just said, yeah, I, I wrote all this because I was PMSing, right? This is the same term that you so well used before. I could have just blamed it. But the point I think I was trying to make is why this need to blame it on something? Um, why can't we just be and, and just um, explore these themes at all points in our life? Did you, um, did you find yourself, though, being able to maybe share things that you typically wouldn't share, but since you already wrote them down on paper and it came out, and once, let's say, your menstrual cycle period for, for that month or every two months, however it is, you know, um, for your circumstances was done, you're like, wow, I can't believe I wrote this. This is, uh, this is something I typically wouldn't write, but I'm going to keep it no matter what I think of it right now because the world needs to see this. Did any of that occur? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think initially when I started writing, I didn't write with the intention to publish. Um, but then I, I was just writing because at that point I felt like I needed to write. And, um, and, and then I thought, you know, why not try to publish this, um, in its unrefined way. Um, we're so focused on, on, censoring and editing and just trying to refine everything so that it's okay for the world um what would happen if you you don't cover up some of it <laughs> i appreciate that all right and so sort of like the free association aspect to psychoanalysis too right we don't we don't cover up our unconscious our unconscious leaks through um, just like <laughs> menstrual blood, it, it leaks through, it's, it finds its way to come up. Um, and, and it's untimely like that, too. I appreciate that analogy, because <laughs> uh, we are constantly and people don't realize this, and it's tough to accept for them. Mm -hmm. And it, it really ties into the subject, how we get a couple details that we're reading, and not reading um, literally, but that we're observing in the physical world. And what we don't understand, our unconscious fills in those gaps. Right. And so to make meaning of this world, and that's our mind. That's not our brain. That's our mind. Our brain is a physical organ. So I tell this all the time. I mean, this is like my audience. And how, by the way, how are you guys doing out there? hope everybody's doing good and enjoying this podcast. Yeah. And, <laughs> but I appreciate that analogy. And I hope these are some good questions because they did take some time last night. Your, your book reads menstruation as a unifying experience. You specify human beings rather than women consistently throughout your art. And I noticed that, that you didn't um, say females or women. You, you, you used human beings. Mm -hmm. um, what is your take on the period and intersectional feminism in general? Great question. Yeah. Um, I think especially during this point in history and time, we're trying to define that, what that means for us. Um, I've noticed a lot of people are more comfortable now with using the term menstruators or people who menstruate um, as opposed to, you know, all women menstruate um, be because of intersectional feminism. That's not always the case. Um, and, and then there are also times when people who, who menstruate, who identify as women and female, um, cisgender, they, they can't, um, whether that's because of an eating disorder or stress or, you know, whatever else that's going on with our body, our body picks up on it and we are not menstruating for that month um, or however many months. If something else is going on in our body, that's, you know, making sure that we 
bleed obviously takes more energy and that doesn't always happen. Um, I appreciate that. What's your opinion in regards to periods and the patriarchy? And I think this is relevant to a question I asked earlier on in that, how do you think that the patriarchy has affected society's views on periods? and menstruation or I, I just I'm very careful with the term as a male because I just don't know um, what's exactly proper or not and I want to yeah. use this opportunity to learn yeah no I appreciate that I think you know sometimes I even don't know the, the proper or politically correct usage as well and I, I'm learning too so um, it's it's a work in progress we're all as a society constantly working um, on evolving our language and what language symbolizes right um i think it's interesting what i will say on the on the patriarchy and periods is that i think it's interesting that there's uh men even in menstruation um so <laughs> i i feel like uh these these language uses are are so fascinating um and and i you know i yeah, I'm sure there's a lot that patriarchy has done to our usage of words and um, language in order to talk about these things. But the the point is to the that we need to analyze it further and and reflect on the language that we use. I never noticed that. I <laughs> I never noticed how the word men was a menstrual cycle, or I never noticed that. Wow. Uh, <laughs> It just makes me wonder even more, you know, like it, it goes deeper and deeper. But there's been a, a lot, there's a lot of institutions at play in mm -hmm. Western culture and all over the world, you know, but I, uh, I've, I have to refer to Western culture. And yeah. I, by your last name, I know that you're from European ancestors. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, for example, the, and I grew up a, a Christian. Mm -hmm. of religious institution. I went to church every Sunday. I volunteered on my own uh, growing up, especially during like the middle school, high school era. And these institutions without realizing their rules stem off the man always being in a position of power. The best way to represent that is that only a male can be a priest. Mm -hmm. And even back then, those uh, the, the women who were menstruating, they were almost separated if I'm not mistaken, you know, I don't know the Bible by its, but, but I remember uh, my grandma used to teach me that they would be separated and mm -hmm. be put in, you know, for, until the menstruation was done. And mm -hmm. so just the fact that they would do this, they would separate the females that were menstruating and they would, they would all hang out on their own. Like mm -hmm. she used to say that there was a spiritual component to that, that there was a reason why that happened. Um, what are you, what's your take on this and have you ever even heard of this? Yeah, yeah, I've, um, I've definitely heard of it. I've heard of so many um, different religious practices um, circling amongst menstrual cycles. So, so I appreciate uh, that. Um, I've heard of some churches not allowing women in the church, um, particularly on Easter, um, if they're on their cycle. Uh, I don't know if, I'm not sure if that stems from the perception that the woman is not clean during this time of rebirth or, um, you know, rejuvenation, but I've heard that one. Um, I've heard in other religions um, that, that women are separated from men during that time and then they have to make sure they're fully washed and fully cleansed. Um, after they finish it and i think they have to wait a certain period of time before they can have sex with the man again or um in these ultra orthodox religions i think um but i'm, I'm not surprised that it's it's creeped its way through religion as well <laughs> yeah no absolutely you know <laughs> and and i said institutions i just use that institution yeah. specific right. because um, every institution is like a spider web. It influences other ones. So I appreciate you touching up on that. So here we go again, as I share another question, but do you think that with more education and normalization in society, that periods can be viewed as a normal body function? Because you mentioned that the woman couldn't go back until she was clean or fully 
cleansed when the menstrual cycle to me in a spiritual way it's a natural uh cleansing that occurs in a fe- in a in a female's body right so do you think that with more education and and your book for example and you're contributing to the cause that the word men- menstruation and the understanding of it will become more normalized and and the female body can be talked about in a more natural way without it being hiding or this is bad and all this stuff? Um, one can only hope. Uh, I don't know if, you know, one book will do that, but it certainly begins by having this splotch of blood out, you know, in bookstores and like seeing that on the shelves, um, having it be more accessible to, to in everyday life um, because it's an everyday function. And um and and the whole thing with you know the cleansing and all of that it's just perpetuates it perpetuates the stigma and the shame that comes with it, which which is really not necessary. Um, the as you've mentioned, the vagina is naturally uh, cleansing. It, it's you know it cleans itself, um, but yet we you know stigmatize this because there's there's the shedding of the blood and and now we have to clean it all up. Yeah, I guess people are scared of what they don't understand, right? And since there's a men and menstrual cycle, you already know how that goes. <laughs> so, so this is this is um, a little bit. Uh, it, this is related to your book, but uh, my girlfriend actually just texted me this live, okay? Mm-hmm. And she <laughs> says, you know, to ask to to read it first to see if it applies. But it applies. Uh, it goes to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, so she wrote here, the first time. I got my period, I was home alone with my dad. My dad didn't know how to help me. He tried, I had to wait until my mom came home to help me clean and explain to me what a period was. Do, do you think, this, obvious, this happens often with little girls, do you think our generation of parents slash fathers are going to be or are already prepared to deal with this situation? Yeah, what's your girlfriend's name, if you don't mind sharing? Her name is Susie. Susie, yeah, I, I, I want to meet her. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Susie, that, that, that is a great question. Um, I think the first person I told was my dad, too, um, because my mom was, I feel like she was doing laundry at the time. Um, so I can relate to that. Um, you know, the fact that Susie and I told our fathers first, uh, I think that's great. I think we deserve kudos because um, we, we're, you know, breaking that stigma through talking to other people, uh, especially men or people who don't mes- menstruate. I think it breaks the, the stigma even more. And that's done through an individual process. Um, uh, through relationships, right? Talking about this just openly, fluidly is, is, is a great way to break the stigma. Um, I remember I learned about it, I don't know when, um, but my friend got, my great friend in, in elementary school got it before I did. And I think she was actually nine years old and, and you know, she didn't know what to do. So she called me into the bathroom and, we didn't have pads we didn't have you know we weren't prepared for this so we you know what I told her to do is to make a makeshift pad with toilet paper um and so we made this we rolled up a bunch of toilet paper and then we went down to the nurse and it's funny how pads are in the nurse's office as if this is some sort of you know emergency that that your your body is bleeding you need the nurse um you need to be bandaged up when really it's normal, natural, but we went to the nurse, we got a pad. The pad that we got was like super thick. There was no need for that. So they weren't prepared. They just gave us the thickest pad and it was, um, (laughs) it was a whole mess. (laughs) I don't have, and and that's a funny story, honestly. And I'm so sure that's so common. Um, that's such a, that's such a common experience for, for females. Uh, so I don't, I don't have any kids of my own. Elena, but if I did, if I did have a, you know, a little girl Mm -hmm. and this did happen uh, while, you know, she was with me and, and mom was out of town or or she was away or she wasn't available at the moment, 
I think I'm going to let you know how I would handle it. Yeah, and, and then you grade me and then you grade me. <laughs> um, I would help her clean up. I would, ask, I would call mom and see where the pads are. I would give her one. Um, probably the, the pad, not the, not the one that goes inside. Right. Tampon. And then I'll just get <laughs> until mom will get in and I would explain to her somewhat what this is, that this is a normal process that happens as you get older. And there's a reason for, there's a lot of reasons for this process, but I just want her to know that it's okay and it's normal and that she's in a safe, she's in a safe place. And, uh, if she needs anything else, you know, not, not to feel embarrassed that I'm here to help her. So I want to see what your grade would be with me as far as how to handle that as a, as a male figure, a male parent. Okay. I don't have any kids, but that's probably right. what I would do. Well, your future kids are listening. So I, I, <laughs> I give you an A plus. I think that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, and I, and I'm glad that you're thinking through about this now. <laughs> so you're fully prepared. I had never thought about this before until we obviously exchanged messages and, and I knew what your book was about. And so it made me think about a lot of different things. And um, I appreciate so much this interview. It all, it's gone past than what I thought it would. And that just goes to show how good of an interview this has been, at least what I feel has been a good interview. So um, I ran out of structured questions to ask. But I do want I do do want to share with you that I appreciate you that I think this book is underrated, and the reason why you wrote this book means means a lot to other people. And I think that what's happening is a lot of people aren't aware of your book, and that was the goal today for you to get some exposure and for people to understand the stigma surrounding menstruation and and why it's important to normalize to talking about the female body points and what happens inside the body. And I hope that this interview was up to par uh, oh, for yeah. you to, no, to you break so that stigma. Yeah, I, I appreciate all of your highly researched and very um, thoughtful questions. And um, I definitely learned a lot through, through our discussion. I mean, even your point on as substance abuse counselors, when when you're handing you know this the urine toxicology you and i can only imagine what you know patients go through when they do this whether it's for therapy or whatever else um that there's you know so much stigma even with that with given with giving someone your you know your urine that may look a little red I think what's, um, and this is somewhat now more relevant to our field, Elena, is that I'm seeing online now over the last, because I've been doing this for about four years, the whole IG thing. And mm -hmm. it's over the last two years, actually, where I've really started making a point to put videos on YouTube. First, they were educational videos. Then they went to more interviewing. And I think I even send you a couple of my podcast yeah. episodes. Oh, they're awesome. Oh, I really appreciate uh, what you do. Oh, uh, no, I appreciate it. And what I'm starting to see now, though, more over the last two years, and I'm not sure why this is happening, is a lot of mental coaches and a lot of uh -huh. brain coaches, right? And notice the terminology they're using. And what I tell people is, is that you can read sometimes all the information you want. You could you can know all the facts in the world, all the details in the world, why everything happens. But at the end of the day, it's not about the facts that you know. It's actually connecting with an individual on a level that's very deep. And you have to know how to respond when things happen. Like, for example, um, I was talking to a brain coach who messaged me and talking to me about why won't I do this? Why would I push forward with this or that with my clients? And I had to explain to them that mo the clients that they're talking about are ideal situations. They're not real life situations that mm -hmm. you actually have to address the struggles the, per the person's going through. Situations like this one that I mentioned and that you obviously took note of, of uh, me having that type of relationship with the client to say, for her to tell me, hey, I'm going through my menstruation cycle. Is that okay? That goes to show at that moment, even though it happened so quick, but after I leave uh, the sessions over, I realize, okay, this, this client actually trusts me on a deeper level than what somebody else would. And that's actually what therapy is about. Um, I don't think some of these brain coaches 
they're prepared to face what's happening in the field as far as Baker acts, Marchman acts. What are you going to do when daddy's cheating on mom, the kid's going, you know, they think that just because they throw out a couple facts that the person's just going to be lifted and go to, I don't know what's going to happen, but yeah. it doesn't really work like that. And this is coming from someone who considers himself pretty prepared by all the literature he reads. So right. I appreciate you know, taking note of that and, uh, and everything. So I guess, um, thank you so much for coming in. I hope yeah. the audience out there enjoys it and enjoyed the interview. It was for you guys. And Elena, I hope, you know, this time was more of an interview about your book, but I hope to have you on as a guest in uh, later podcast episodes so we can talk about various subjects. You're very, obviously very creative. You're obviously very well informed. You're very smart. And um, it was delightful to talk to you. Okay. So thank, thank you, you so much. much. Juan, I really appreciate, um, you know, you offering uh, the interview today and sharing the platform to talk about these issues. And, and I appreciate a lot of the work that you're doing. Um, I mean, there was a reason I reposted and, and I love your, your page and your YouTube channel. And I really appreciate our discussion today. I think it was great. It made me think and um, it was very insightful. See you guys. Psych Life and... Stay tuned for more.